way into the road. And then that was looking at the house, so you can see the grass is still green. We have got a pump in the driveway, a small pump in the pump, so the barrier kept the house dry. And then that is a photo looking down the main street as well. So you might be wondering, what is the water gate and how does it work? Well, it's a cool piece of technology which is unique in the way that once rolled out, it self-deploys. It uses the weight of the water to hold the water back, and it's probably easiest if I show you this um, short clip of how to deploy the product. So the barrier comes in a roll, and you simply unroll it. It's highly portable and takes barely any storage space. Um, we believe it can provide an efficient and fact, uh, effective fast response resource uh, by dealing with emergency situations. And the barriers are already used by water companies, the Environment Agency and homeowners across the UK. So you can see from the video how there's a weighted base, uh, this section here, and the water pushes it down and then lifts the top section up on the water back. So we think the main rival to Watergate um, is sort of the sandbag. However, the sandbags don't perform their primary role very well. They're also expensive because they're not reusable. Uh, and in Sir Michael Pick's review in 2007, after the floods, he said that uh, the review was unable to obtain any significant evidence that sandbags proved particularly effective. Yet still nearly 10 years on, we were using them in, in the recent flooding, uh, which is quite disappointing. The Watergate's recently been awarded ethnic approval uh, following testing by the US Army as well, which is a, a worldwide accreditation. And over the past three years, uh, we've supplied thousands of metres of barrier all across the UK, and we're really proud of the work we do to know that we can help protect homes, communities and infrastructure. It can make a real difference to people's lives. Uh, so here's a photo of some work we did in Buckinghamshire. Uh, there's a, a crate there, you can have the barrier connected together, drive along and it will concertina and fold out the back of the crate. And this housing estate in Buckinghamshire, there's 300 houses on the housing estate, uh, and they've got 800 metres of barrier. They also had a few other things as well, large pumps, non-return valves fitted to the stream. But the scheme actually worked out, I think about £300 a house, so it was a very cost-effective way of protecting uh, all the homes. And this is a photo showing off the barrier's logo. Uh, but in February, we were sent a photo, uh, this one here, and that's uh, some houses in Devon. It was part of the Devon Pathfinder sort of project working out what products worked and what didn't. Um, and that was the first time that the village had flooded and their homes had it. And there's 12 houses on that housing estate. Uh, so again, it worked out less than £200 a house um, for that one barrier, but it, it protected them from flooding. They can also roll it out, leave it there and drive over it, because um, it lies flat, knowing that it will uh, rise as the water rises. And then the, the other photo is a sort of smaller community. Uh, again, they've got some funding and have a selection of Product. So the work we do is uh, sort of varied depending on the scale. Now obviously there are um, other temporary defences available, uh, so I'll talk about them as they're, they're a technology. Uh, so I've taken a few photos off the respective suppliers' websites. Uh, so the top left we've got a product called Floodstock. Uh, the top middle is one the Environment Agency use widely, I think it's called the Geo Design, so A-frame metal barrier. Uh, the top right is called Tiger Dam, which is a water filled system, and that's again similar to the bottom middle, which is a water filled system, uh, the Anchor Dam. Then the bottom left, again used by the Environment Agency, uh, is a product called the Hesco Bastion, which is sort of filled with uh, sand, sandy gravel. And then the bottom right, Aqua Sacks, which is sort of self inflated sandbags. Uh, the Watergate is also actually used by the Environment Agency already. And um, as, as Catherine was saying, there's uh, been a big shift with the Environment Agency and they're now looking at more uh, temporary defences. Uh, I've also got a case study from, well, testimonial from the um, Environment Agency of them using the Watergate uh, with Neil Clayton saying he was amazed how easily the product rolled out and the way it sealed. So alongside setting up and um, running flood protection solutions, I also studied a degree in civil engineering at the University of Nottingham. And many of my modules were about climate change, water in the environment, uh, sustainable drainage, sort of geotechnics. 
And day by day, the planet's changing. We don't really realize because we wake up and look out the window every morning and think, well, it's the same as yesterday. And it sort of catches us by surprise that the climate change is happening. If we look uh, at the sort of extremes of weather we've had. Now, 20 minutes isn't nearly enough time for me to talk to you about all the technology that can be used for flood defense. Um, but one of them, uh, I believe, sort of falls under technology is sustainable drainage schemes. Um, they're a natural approach to sort of managing uh, drainage in and around properties and other developments. Uh, so you might have seen um, this photo or video online showing what sort of hailed as a magic concrete. Uh, and Top Mix claimed that it can actually uh, absorb 880 gallons of water per metre squared in just 60 seconds. So it could be a technology that we use more of slowing the water down, reaching the water courses, uh, again feeding it into sort of swales, uh, allowing for pollutants to be uh, dealt with naturally. Uh, and then another, another sort of technology that's um, obviously going to be really useful is flood level sensors. And with the sort of environment agents freeing up their data, as we've heard, uh, this sort of gauge map has been able to be produced. Uh, so the one on the screen is actually the nearest gauge map to uh, my village, which I showed you earlier. And the sort of other flood level sensors as well, so that project I showed you in Buckinghamshire, uh, they have flood level sensors fitted to their uh, stream. Uh, it alerts the council and also can actually be as important as your barrier. Uh, so one thing I always like to sort of say as an example is, is if you had two inches of rain, or actually like in Cumbria, a foot, um, that's, a, that's a foot that you've got on the dry side of your barrier, uh, which needs to be managed and then pumped back to the wet side. So pumps are really important, and choosing a pump can be a minefield, but one of my favourite types is a puddle pump. So sort of, here's one I made earlier. Uh, these can suck down to a millimetre in depth, uh, and they won't burn out in the same way that a sump pump will. So they've got an oil filled chamber, so they can almost grow dry. Suck down to a really low level. So say even if you have a sort of washing machine inside, you can use one of these. And it's almost like a wet bag that can suck the water straight down, and they're great for use in sort of flood situations. We work closely with Obar pumps who have got a stand back there and they supply, uh, supply those pumps. The other types are sort of sump pumps which are very good for dealing with groundwater flooding and if you've got them left in the ground they can be uh, fully automatic. And then engine driven pumps uh, which have the highest flow rates of the three. They're great for draining large areas and also great because you don't need an electricity supply to power them. Uh, so with these pumps we'd always recommend you had a generator uh, as a backup as well. We're trying to sort of simplify it down on our website because uh, it is sort of a minefield. People don't tend to know what they're looking for. Uh, they just want a pump to help protect them. Uh, one, another item that's likely to become uh, more commonplace we're dealing with sort of managing flood defence, looking at flooding, are drones. And actually, one of my clients went to see them, and somehow they managed to remain very calm. They knew they were going to flood, they had plenty of warning, um, and they proved everything upstairs, they'd done what they could, and he got his drone out and decided to film the water rising around the property, which is fascinating because you can see exactly where it was coming from first, how it surrounded the property, the sort of level it got to, and it was great for being able to design a flood defence scheme with them. Um, but also, so the drones you can use as well uh, to inspect flood defences, so sort of uh, maybe reservoirs that normally could be hard to access in, uh, in flood situations. And they've had a growing number of applications over the past few years. They're now able to sort of carry sensors and cameras, um, and I imagine it's likely we'll, we'll see more of these being used. Uh, one of the things I studied with my degree as well, so using GPS um, to sort of improve the accuracy of, of uh, weather predictions, um, and it's likely that that will continue to improve over the coming years, and uh, again be a technology that can help mitigate against flood defences. Now, although I'm here to talk about technology, as good as technology is, sometimes it's best to work with nature. Um, and the Wildlife Trust believes that the current flooding crisis means there's ever been a stronger incentive uh, to rethink our relationship with water and how we use our land and space in our towns and cities. So it again links in with the sort of SUD scheme I was showing you earlier. 
Um, if we look back to sort of the Mississippi, uh, we tried hard engineering, taking out the meanders, lining it with concrete, to speed up the flow, and it didn't work. The river wanted to meander again, um, and it's now been left to sort of do what it wants naturally. Uh, and I think we're sort of starting to look at the same thing, how can we slow the flow uh, and actually use nature uh, uh, to, help, to help mitigate against flooding. Um, but it doesn't matter how good technology is, we obviously need to use uh, common sense. So we always pride ourselves on making sure our clients know that they uh, know how they're going to use the kit they've got. So training is an important part of flood defence. Um, and that's all I've got to talk about. Oh, in fact, no, hang on. Oh, I was going to just briefly talk about flood plans. Uh, I was recently having a chat with Paul Lockhart from the environment team, so you might, you might know him. Uh, we were talking about flood plans, saying that all, everyone should really have a flood plan, even if you're not on a flood day. Because uh, Paul was saying to me that he'd got a hot tank in his loft, uh, and it leaked whilst he was away. And when he came back, everything was soaking. He had no idea where um, he turned off the water. He had no idea where he kept his insurance documents. Um, and really, he needed a grab bag of kit of stuff that he could take away quickly. So if you've got a flood plan, it's important to make sure you know where uh, your sort of shut-off valves are. Keep your insurance documents in a waterproof file and somewhere where you know where they are. Um, and then sort of, again, sort of linking back to common sense, but making a plan of it and making sure you're aware of what you do in that situation. Um, another thing uh, I was chatting to Matthew from Obart Pumps about was potentially having flood buddies. So if you're a business, linking up with another business saying, you know, we're in a flood area, if we flood, is there any chance we can come and sit in your cafe and use your Wi-Fi so we can carry on working? So having a sort of flood buddy scheme between businesses so you can carry on, um, and again, sort of a resilience measure, because um, as good as flood defences are, there is always a chance that, you know, there could be overtops or um, water might come from somewhere that we hadn't expected, so groundwater or surface water flooding. So it's important to look at resilience measures as well. Uh, and then that's back to me and me sort of posing with K-Burnies. <laughs>